Hi, I'm Ken Boa, and with Reflections Ministries, and uh, with Re- this Reflections podcast, my associate is Stuart McAllister. Hi, Ken. Good to join you again as we old explorers start exploring together some of the themes of life, mm. faith, God, beauty, goodness, and truth. All those wonderful transcendentals and the things that really relate to the basic questions that people must be answering, asking, mm. but so few people do. Uh, where did I come from? Uh, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? So the question of, of origin, but also identity mm-hmm. and uh, a sense of purpose. What is my purpose here on this planet? And what's my hope? Where am I heading? And so, I think yeah. one of the things is we were looking at in previous discussions we've been talking about, I mean, we're talking about the spiritual life. I mean, and we, we, we want to talk over time about evidences for the existence of God. Sure. And But many people who are, uh, are listening and many people who are seeking already believe in God, but one of the great problems of the Christian life, I think, struggle existentially is the question of, of faith. You know, the just shall live by faith. Therefore, those who are justified by faith shall shall live. So both that justification by faith, but by living by faith. And this this is a hard thing sometimes, especially I'm thinking in light of the work that you've done in, over time on Shaped by Suffering. But let's talk a bit about faith, Ken, because I, I'd love to talk to you as you're, you've had a long journey, as I have too. Um, yours is longer than mine. So, I, I mean, I think I want to hear a veteran who has seen um, many reasons not to trust in God as the world or as even some Christians today see it. So talk about this, about faith and, and trust and what that looks like uh, in the daily Christian walk. Why is that so foundational? Yeah. And, of course, how hard it is to trust. Yes, and as we know... Uh, 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 Martin Luther thought of James as a right strawy epistle because he didn't get the idea that it appeared that he's claiming that, unlike Romans 4, James is talking about those who are justified by works. Mm -hmm. But yet they're talking about the same thing, but from two different dimensions, aren't they? Mm -hmm. This whole idea. But that can raise questions for people. Because uh, he will say then, uh, someone may say, you have faith. But he goes on to say, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac? So this right. really raises attention but for that, people. But that question, I think, again, I often felt that as an evangelical <clears throat> Christian, yes. we were fighting continuously Reformation battles or battles that were not necessarily They're relevant re- really to relevant, our life. No. In other words, because I'm not asking you know, the question of um, faith versus works in terms of salvation. And so many of the messages, so much of the talking always comes down, oh, you know, we're not saved by works, we're saved by, yes, okay, that's not the point we're talking about here. Um, Often the person was asking, and that is a legitimate question in this place, without doubt, but what does it mean to exercise faith in the daily nuts and bolts of going to an office, of living with bad emotions, of having a cranky mother-in-law, father-in-law, kids or being the cranky person yourself and yet trying to love God and walk with God and believe God yes. in the midst of daily living. Yes. And that's integrating the works in the faith because a faith that's alive is a faith that will work. And so then then the question have is what are the fruits and what are the evidences that I am? Remember the old thing that I remember it was a card and it was along with um, some old evangelistic techniques that were used. And it was a card that says, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to, to convict, convict you? you? And I, I remember that funny yeah, yeah. card. Yeah. I don't think I ever used it, right. but you get the idea though, yeah. that there should be some kind of palpable change in one's life. And then what does that look like in the arenas uh, in which we operate? Now, you've had lots of experience. I mean, part of this is to try and let uh, people know about your journey. Um, but what would you say then, what were some of the early prompts? And we'll come along, maybe look at some of the later ones. But what would you say were some of the big initial faith challenges where you had these kind of a aha moments and you began to see what trusting God both demanded and what it looked like in your life? Yes. Um, one of the, our, my first real challenge of faith as a pretty young uh, believer, I was living in Berkeley, California at the time. And suddenly it became clear to me that I needed to, to now get rid of the risks, or to take a risk of following what he's, my, the spirit had called, called me to do. I had applied to Dallas Seminary, mm-hmm. and I didn't know if I had been accepted. But there, that was the first time where I was actually asked to put it in the line. I was going to give up my graduate student deferment. 
And I, my draft code was such I would have definitely been. So the question was, are you going to step it out and do it? You, you, you applied. When you say draft code, you mean drafted to, was that Vietnam at the time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You would have been a United Yeah, because this was 67. So this was the summer of 67. Wow. Okay. And the interesting thing, though, is I consciously knew that he, it was like a honeymoon. As you know, sometimes people have a, amazing things when you first become a believer. <laughs> yeah. Every Your prayers are answered. And, all, yeah. and then then you get down to, okay. The hard work part. Yeah. <laughs> now we take off the training wheels. And yes. we, we you know, begin to really get serious. Right. And that was a defining moment for me. It was the first major life risk right. I had to take. And I knew along with that, I wasn't to call the seminary to see if I had been accepted. And so the interesting part of that is I was called to step out in faith because I didn't know if I'd been accepted there at all. And tell me what you were going through at the time. So you, what did you did you have a, did you have anxiety? Did you um, were you fretting a little bit, or were you quite calm through the whole thing? Or? Yeah, it was more of a, of a of an existential encounter with God saying, "Now is the time for you to step out. I've I've been covering you here." But now it's time for you to do what you came, what you called to yourself to do, because you had applied to go there. When you came to faith, um, you knew that that's where you'd be going. Mm. Now, that's what it's going to look like. Are you going to just continue to hold on? Or are you going to let go? And See, I, I want to go into that a little bit, because that takes me back to my... You have experiences along this yeah, line. But the, the first journey, so when I came to faith, um, and of course I was still trying to understand what Christianity yes. meant, and then I, I got, heard this very radical message about, particularly from Luke 9, you know, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And Operation Mobilization and the, the orientation messages from George Verver and Dale Roton and some of these other voices at the time, they were very, very radical. And I mean, it was just raw scripture. And I mean, as yeah. I was looking at the text, that's what it said. Yeah. But I hadn't heard anyone else say, I mean, here I was living, I'd just become a Christian. Yes. And most of the people were middle class Christians. So they were doing normal jobs, which was fine. Yeah. I didn't see them all uh, rushing to leave and go on mission. And yet the message, that's what I was being told to do. So I literally remember thinking, okay, um, I have to sell everything, which I did. And empty my bank accounts, which I did, which is amazing. and give it all away either to the church, my money, or the mission, and then went out. Um, now that was the happy start. We could talk a little bit, but but the 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 issue was so clear to me was that for me, and I wasn't saying that was the general yes, rule. Yes, yes. But the, it's like you said, it was that euphoria that God is in this. It was an adventure. I could trust Him. Yes. Even the but I didn't think through all the mechanics, and maybe that's good. You're not supposed to. Perhaps so. Of selling everything, but then still having to live day by day. Mm -hmm. So that was what what gave you the assurance that you needed to make that that step, because it goes from intention to action, and something allowed you to uh, make a vol volitional risk. You took a risk. risk. It's, faith is always a risk. Isn't you know, it? it's good yeah. that you asked that because I think Ken, uh, I never thought that until yes, it was partly was obviously the, the power of the story. I was getting caught up in the Gospels. Yes. But I was getting caught up also in the testimonies of those who had done this. So I was hearing stories of George Muller. I okay. was hearing stories of Adoniram Judson. Yes. I was hearing stories, and even the other OMers yes. who had gone, and then stories of answered prayer, really miraculous things of God providing and you know going right to the last minute. And to be honest, within that very first uh, year, that was my experience. It was like we went out and there were times when we were way beyond my uh, uh, my faith or whatever, um, and ha depending on God, and God came yes, through. Yes. But it wasn't always <clears throat> in an easy way, and it came with a lot of, um, like you said, taking the training wheels off. It came with a lot of, ouch, this hurts, or I'm not sure, where are you, God? Sure. And screaming out sometimes for clarity in, you know, in the midst of it. Those are growth pains, and the, the interesting thing is there's a very clear parallel between both of us because in a defined point, not long after our conversion, I think both of us were called now to, okay, now it's time to get serious about this. Mm -hmm. I think something similar happened with you as happened with me, and indeed it led to some times that we didn't know where we, our next meal would come from. Right. And the same kind of a thing happened with me. So I love these parallels, even though they're a different context. Yeah, and so you, I think what I, it, it would be important, just so that we don't make, make this too rosy, is to, to talk to get each other maybe about the, the hard times when there was a time where you, um, you, were, you knew that or you sensed or felt or 
you God, you were being asked to trust God, but it wasn't playing out. Or you had gone what you thought was the case and it didn't work out, but still God was there, right? Mm -hmm. And there's still a learning experience. So this, you know, that God, the iconoclast, the breaking up the, the yes. images of what you think God is like and yes. this kind of thing. He keeps changing the rules on us, or so we suppose. But yeah. actually what he's doing is he's causing us to see things from new perspectives. But every step provides the next insight. The idea of the your word is a lamp unto my feet and the, and the light to my path. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, in the ancient Near East, uh, in the darkness, uh, say if there was a moonless night, it'd be a treacherous journey. But if you had that little lantern in front of you, it would illuminate the next step. And so it was with you and me, I think, that we had a step in front of us. Okay, but you must take the next or you'll have no more light. And so only yeah. when you take that step will you, you be able walking. But this doesn't mean that the journey will be an easy one. So how would you define trust? How do you define trust, Ken? I mean, what do you, I mean, trust, because I know it's not a one-time thing. In fact, if anything, I think one of the things we've learned as we've talked even through these COVID years of late and the struggles of some of the things we've both seen in this last few years. Um, yeah, trust. What does trust look like? Yes. What does it mean? Yeah. In one sense, it's, it's choosing to obey, to choose, it's trust, trust is manifested, isn't it, in the works of obedience, mm -hmm. a choice that I have to choose to put it in practice. If I don't, if I say I'm going to trust in some, I'm still holding on to that trapeze. I'm not going to let go mm -hmm. as the other is approaching. Mm -hmm. But in, only when you let loose of that is at the point in which you now have committed yourself unreservedly and, and your well-being into his hands in a very clear way. A risk, yeah. But I think it's a risk-taking venture. A risk-taking venture. You know, I, I, um, I mean, there's, there's several stories, but one in particular was when... Um, and we had like dialogue on this. You know, I, I had been over here uh, in the States for a, about nine months and I was at Precept Ministries and studying. And during this year, I had it was a fantastic time for me because I was allowed to study the Bible. I was going with there was people who were very serious about prayer. I actually recruited a whole ton of people who wanted to go on mission through that huh. year and ended up going huh. with Youth with the Mission or with OM both. But so I come back with this and we've been studying both John's gospel and the book of Romans. So the character of God, the doctrines of the faith, I am pumped. And I remember I was tasked this summer um, to lead these teams into Eastern Europe. And it was a high risk thing because we were taking gospels and still during the communist years. And we were going to distribute uh, tens of thousands of these without being seen to distribute them. So we had to put them out in public places where they would be found, but not be seen doing so and not get caught. So that's a tricky business. <laughs> Those are so it was, and of course, I'm, I had done this in the, I had done it a few years earlier and been caught and put in jail. But anyway, um, so I was leading now. I was pretty and you, confident. And you knew the risks. I knew yeah. the risks. Um, anyway, it all was, was going well. And one of these trips, we were going to Poland and there were some real problems. This was coming up to the solidarity time. So there were things brewing in Polish and there was a lot of tension in the country. Although Poland was a relatively easy country in some sense, but you still had to go through Czechoslovakia to get there. Well, here was the plan. I was supposed to rendezvous with another team who would bring, I would pick up the, the literature. And it was about, uh, there were going to be two teams of us. And we would rendezvous at Auschwitz, of all places, the death mm. camp, ah. uh, and pick up the. Well, I would pick up the literature, take it to both teams, and we'd divide it, and then the two teams would go on and do their work. So, I go to. Uh, they said they dropped my team because they weren't able to know that we could share information with everyone for security reasons. I go and to do the rendezvous, send my team off for the day, and they never come. The people never come. Now this is a long story, so we wanted to parse the whole thing. Yeah. But long and short was. Um, uh, uh, I got I got the literature, all of it, but the other team never showed up. Oh, so now I had two team loads, which was about forty thousand gospels, in a van with seven guys and their team, and ba basically everything began to go wrong. So this is what I'd like to talk about: trust. When when what you think should happen, when you're you're there on mission, we've we've met these parameters. And things start going wrong. Yeah. And it was a, it was a story of one thing after another, in which I remember at one point coming to absolute despair, thinking, "That's yeah. it. I can't be a Christian. Um, yeah. I can't do this. God's not with me." Um, 
maybe I should just take the team money, fly off to the Bahamas <laughs> and run away like Jonah. Yeah. yeah. But I couldn't because of the truth in my mind. The truth was, uh, so that so gripped you and your mind, your grasp, your clarity of that this is warranted, uh, justified, warranted belief. This is warranted. This is a basis um, that he's given you this. Are you going to cling to that? Or are you going to be unwavering, uh, wavering rather? And, well, but and, the and, pain can, that's why I think for many people don't, but having to go through the pain, you cannot get to, to true faith. You cannot deepen trust in the absence of the pain. That's right. I know things that I can talk about this now, but I can tell you at the time it was very dark and I can tell you there were points where I was almost in despair. And yet it was only afterwards then that when God did deliver, we did get the literature go, we got out of the country, all kinds of things. And I saw, but and I remember driving home to Vienna with the team, and we were exhausted and dirty, and needed showers, and and all I could, and I and I was, I was praising God, but with that kind of whimper. Yes, but you there, you had a history now, because what you're doing with trust is taking risks. Mm -hmm. Now they're based upon good reason, who God is, what He's revealed to us. But at the same time, you're going to take a risk, and there may be, there's no guarantee that the outcomes will be favorable. In fact, often there's pain that's involved, but even that pain is part of the growth process to give mm -hmm. us wisdom, that awful pain that drives us to the grace of God. But still you press on because you're convinced that uh, the, the one who called you will also bring you, you, you safely to the, uh, the, now, the you've shore. Written, you've written a lot um, in, in, in your literature. I know one of the books that I, I loved a lot, Shaped by Suffering, which is part of that trilogy, I think, because it really is a, a vision of the Christian life, you know, re, you're broke, rewriting your broken yes. story, living in the presence of God. And then I've heard you say quite a lot, even more of late as well, that the, the people, because there's something hot -wired. I think that faith and trust in God means I don't have to suffer, or I could, it's some kind of version of the prosperity gospel, which isn't just out there in, in certain, it, it seems to me all of us want, a ticket to ride, the Beatles said. Yeah, right, a ticket to ride. <laughs> Which means <laughs> brings a, back a problem free yeah. life. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. You want to get out of jail free card or whatever yeah. it might be, but yeah. it's not it's never been promised that. And so the promises that we have then are the promises that God will take me safely home. He didn't tell me how I'm going to be, whether it's going to be a storm tossed dinghy or I'm going to be on the QE2. He doesn't, he tells me you're going to go there, but he doesn't tell you how it's going to be, but he'll bring it safely to the other side. I love that, that challenge with the disciples, get into the boat, we're going to go to the other side. Mm. But he didn't tell them how they'd get across that there'd right. be a storm, but they would get to the other side. Oh. And what about you in your life then? Because I know what would what, tell us one of the your, the uh, biggest challenges to developing trust that you faced. Well, I have these experiences that are like um, dots in my life. So the mm -hmm. one I mentioned before, when I took the risk, he then supported me in that. Right. And each each risk each I take, to something else. each leads to another. So when, for example, in that case, I knew I wasn't supposed to call the seminary to find out if I'd been accepted. They said, I you applied for midterm January 68, but we don't guarantee, it. rarely do we uh, accept people. Mm -hmm. But instead of doing it, took the risk and left it all behind. So it was, a, then that's the sort of a thing I have no other options. And mm -hmm. so when you sense that palpable urge to obey him, and leave the outcome in God's hands, then it may be difficult, but he'll honor it. Mm -hmm. So in my case, he honored it by this story I love to tell very briefly, though. But uh, when I got to Dallas, um, my friend stayed in the car. He didn't want anything to do with this. But I went up into the, the steps and so forth. There was no one there. Mm -hmm. Not a person was there. Mm -hmm. uh, they must have been in chapel, I look back and realize, right. because nobody was in the campus yeah. at all. And I go and I find myself by myself into Davidson Hall, and then uh, it was the right building. And then I signed the right place in the building, find myself in the registrar's office. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, no one's there, but there's a letter facing me addressed to Kenneth Boa, 3010 Grove Street, Berkeley, California, with my letter of acceptance wow. sitting on the counter. Mm -hmm. Now that, I opened it up, and that's what it was, and I walked out, and it's, again, never saw anybody. <laughs> So it's one of those magic moments to yeah. say, you yeah. took the risk. Now I'm going to say, I, the, I, those who honor me, I will also honor. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and it's building a history. It's building a sense of trust in the sense of 
here I have, I call it a dot because it's something I, I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. They came through and you have dots all over your life. Yeah. Where God is, tell us that story about that, that when, when you were virtually upside down, you couldn't get out of the, out of the van. It was, um, you were trying to um, uh, get e extricated there and you couldn't escape. Um, well, there's one, um, there's one story I, I, when uh, my friend was, uh, we were driving back, we had to get out of, out of a, one of the Eastern European during martial law and we were racing towards the border and um, I had been sleeping in the back and uh, we came up on an unmarked truck, broken down in the, and, he, and he didn't realize what it was until the last minute and slams on the brake and I, I was in this bed thing and came flying, flying off and down and I was buried um, and, and then as I was trying to get up off the floor and I was upside down looking at, up at you know, and, and all I could see was something right against, and we, basically we were like um, two or three inches from the windscreen. We'd almost hit the, which would have decapitated yeah. him yes. and killed me because yeah. I was in the back. I think that's the one, um, yeah. So it was, um, yeah, just one of those those moments where there was, uh, I, I don't see God intervening. You're great that something alerted him in, in the process, even though he, yeah. he, he didn't fully see it. Or he wouldn't have been going that, that's, but he saw it just in time, you know? Yes. Yeah. So the whole idea then that you have a history and you build a history of trust mm -hmm. by seeing that when you took a risk, God then did come through, not in the way usually in the timing and the method no. that we would expect, but he does come through and I can then note that. And it's a good thing for me to remember that like an Ebenezer so that I so can how, revisit how does this that. work then? I mean, not, and as we think about just um, disappointments and answers to prayer or waiting things out because you know again we've got all of us have stories and there are many good pictures i think of the story in um john chapter you know 11 about lazarus and raising you know and, and the whole point of jesus uh, they send message lazarus he whom you love is sick and when jesus hears he waits and we know that's a very famous text yes it is because of the, the fact that jesus chose to delay and then comes and then oh lord if you had been there this yes. and i've had that over and over i've had it in my own life i remember when nabil qureshi um, got very sick with cancer and and people you know he was getting bombarded with tens of thousands of requests of people who are praying for him promising him and he himself uh, began to get to the point where if you don't believe I'm going to be healed don't pray for me so it became a very interesting yes, question of trust and of course almost a year to the day in which he got that cancer he died um, and I don't think it was a lack of prayer I don't think any, but in God's timing there was something else afoot but I remember one lady coming to me and very confused or upset and saying, uh, walking in the room, you know, so, because I was with the organization at this time that Nabil served with, and sort of pointing her foot, why did God let this happen? Why did God take Nabil Koresh? And I thought, that was a kind of strange question. I understand it from the love of a human person, but sure. was God in heaven making mistakes? Yeah. Did God not know what was going on? And yet, so this part of trust seems that somehow um, second-guessing the wisdom of God, trying to understand. We don't know many times what's going on, do no, we? No, we don't. We, uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's a step in the light, but it's not, it is in the light, but we're heading toward the light. But at the same time, there's a lot of darkness along the way. So I do not know. But as I take a step and he honors that, then he makes the next one possible. But I have to say that there is a growing process where you see a history and you begin to realize, well, first of all, we can't tell God when and how to do it. He gives life, he takes it away. He, how do I know the divine calculus as to with, whether he had accomplished the purpose for his being on this planet? Mm -hmm. And so I can't be so presumptive. The danger, I think, is bitterness caused by people putting their trust in things God never promised. That's interesting. Rather, so, as opposed tease, to... Tease that out. Yes, because I think that um, this is more common than I think yeah. it's generally uh, thought so we, of. So we, we, we basically generate false expectations. I think that the Christian, like, God does this, or therefore, because I am good, I deserve health, wealth, success. I wouldn't say it overtly, but I right. think I do. Because when something goes wrong, I put an expectation. Why is God, I'm in a joke, why is this happening to right. me? So it's using God really as, as a... Uh, a source by which he is obligated to take care of us and protect us because I've made these promises or claims or so forth. But what you're doing there, there's nothing in text in the text that says it's going to be an easy life at all. In fact, 
if anything, we're assured that there will be a hard life uh, if we and have more persecution and so forth. So what happens then is that they put their hope in something God never promised because they're taught to do so. And the church then focuses on that rather than the character of God mm -hmm. and letting loose of the outcome and, and supposing I know when and how and, and how much, because I think that's the presumption. God, if he, if he was God, if he was honorable, if he was just, he would have delivered this person because obviously he needs, he has another 35 years of ministry at least in him. Well, how does, how does, how does she know that? How do we know right. when a person's, when God's purpose is achieved? So I have to let loose. What I have to do is trust in his character those, and based upon his promises, but not in something. But if I put my hope that God never promised, so we'll have some probably background noise here from a wind blowing. We can just hopefully mm -hmm. uh, include that in our talk. Yeah. So, but in terms of, of building trust, Ken, how do you see, how do people nurture trust in life? How does is trust deepened in, in our behavior, in our walk with God? Taking steps, seeing the outcome. And test me and, t and see if I'm, I'm not who I claim to be. Mm -hmm. But that means that you will take steps of faith that are required that um, records you to go beyond the visual, visible to the invisible and to believe that he's got a purpose for you even in, in spite of the fact I cannot see what it is. So trusting him again is to realize I can't tell him when, how much, and, and, and how to do a thing. Because otherwise I'm demanding. It's a, almost like the word faith movement. That's, well, that's, and that's, part of the, that's why this is an interesting discussion for me because I think as we've been talking about about trust and clearly so our moment uh, at the moment things that we've we've had covid we've had you know the, the war in ukraine has been raging now for several months and looks like it's escalating to some degree we've now had you know um the rupture of a gas pipeline between germany and so forth that has ramifications we have the chinese flex in their muscles we have the south koreans flying rockets off we have radical islam in the background that we stopped talking about because it's not in use today but it's that's still correct there. it's still there um, it didn't go away yeah. and and then we're constantly unsure now about the latest monkey pox whatever it is any other kind of diseases that are on the spread so there seems to me incredible um reasons and because of the media bombardment for people to stay anxious all the time. What That's does correct. trust look like now, today? Mm -hmm. So to hope in the promises of God means that they have to be kept before me. Mm -hmm. And essentially, they will dissipate, they will thin, and the visible world will occlude the invisible every time. And so what will happen is I will no longer see according to God's word unless I'm feeding it because it dissipates. So for me to trust, again, what biblical faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So I'm, I'm actually pursuing that, which is not yet and not uh, visible. But that's not a technique, Ken, is it to you? No. For you, I mean, for us, I think the Christian story is to operationalize, I don't even know if that's a word, yeah. but to apply the truth that, that, that Christianity is objectively true, the gospel is objectively real, the word of God is objectively there, that the spirit is objectively here and yes. subjectively yeah. encountered. Right. And But practices are essential to living the Christian faith. Yes. There's no Christian life without discipline. There's no Christian life without... If you don't do the things that Jesus said and told us to do... You can't get any other fruit or no, the results. You can't. So he told us the way, and he told us how to follow and find the way. And he told us that you need to know me. And then to know me, of course, not it's not just limited to the mind, but to knowing him experientially, personally, relationally, in a participatory mind. way. And then by as we know him, then we, of, of course, can love him. And th the more we know him in that way, the more we can love him. But in my view, love then also relates to trust because you see, if I don't love him, if I don't, if I'm not convinced he has my best interest for me in mm -hmm. my mind, in my heart, why would I trust him enough to obey him? I won't. So I have to be convinced that he knows better than me. And this is a learning process because my plans never work out as they ought to. <laughs> then I look back and realize, no, he's training me and teaching us, training us in the way of righteousness, but you have to continue to move you. Otherwise, he will not... Uh, work in us unless we allow him to do that. You know that that whole process. so that whole. I mean, and maybe that's the subject. I think maybe we might want to come into um, in our next talk about looking at what it means to know God, because obviously this this trust, knowing, and obedience they're they're all interrelated. They all relate together. Yes. Again, the Augustinian notion that without God we cannot; without us, He will not. 
Wow. Say that again. Without God, we cannot. That's yeah. that's the divine sovereignty. Right. But without us, He will no. not. So now we are have a, a re, the dignity, the awful, shall I say, dignity of of agent of participation. Yeah, participation. Yes, and yeah. so that means that we have been given the dignity of contributing to that causality of things, and not just some passivity, some kismet some fatalism, some determinism, but rather that, no, you are, in fact, a being who is a moral agent, whose choices will actually affect things, whose prayers will matter. And so you've been given and accorded that rich dignity of participation. But if you choose not, it's you funny. won't make it happen. I keep thinking, you know, just the old hymn um, that sometimes we can all laugh at because we think that they're, don't, we didn't see their, their existential power and relevance, yeah. but you know, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. And I mean, the the sense of that is actually right on target, isn't it? I love that because, and I still remember uh, singing it when I was a kid. I didn't know Jesus. I, right. I believed about him and all, but yeah, yeah, I didn't know yeah. him. But I always thought that's a nice little tune, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. But what did that mean for me? It sounded good, but I didn't really understand it until I had to live it. And that was a process of experience. So you can have it in your head, but to talk about trust and obedience in, in, in theoretically, and then to talk about it experientially mm. and uh, phenomenologically, that's another matter entirely. That involves our agent participation. Yeah. And it means taking risks because we're always taking risks. It's just we risk, uh, risk is, uh, faith is always is a universal. Mm. Uh, two things about faith, everyone lives by faith, right. and it's only as good as the object when it's placed. Yeah, so go. it's a universal theme, yeah. but let's put our faith in the right thing. And this is the problem that people are hoping and, and putting their faith in things God didn't promise. So to, to believe him, to, to, uh, hope, you know, to, to hope for versus hoping in. Yeah. There's a huge difference between what I hope for and what I hope in. So that looks like something we need to tease Would be out. Was worth about. teasing out too? Yeah, I think we, yeah. we talk about they work together. Um, yeah, talking about trusting the knowledge of God, growing in the knowledge of God, and grow, growing through the experience. Because I think I think that that we're, we can be too simplistic with it. Some people think I think is growing with knowledge is simply amassing information. Yes. And you can someone well, I read this book, or I went to this seminar, or I had Ken, or I heard you know Billy Graham, or I heard whoever, and you know, and I, then I had these problems as if hearing alone that should and have having it. the information was yeah. done it. Yeah, I got the facts, yeah. I got the data, yeah. but it, I, the experience didn't match up. Well, yeah. maybe you didn't apply things. Yeah. Maybe you didn't. <laughs> Application has some bearing, doesn't uh, it? Yeah, it seems to be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Knowledge junkies, people who want to know a lot but are not, are thin on application, and this is pretty common. Well, I'm going to come back to you on that because I want to keep teasing out this trust, knowing God, and how these things relate in a practical life, a world. And I think there's a lot from scripture, there's a lot from history, there's a lot from life that we can we can look at to say that, that walking with God is not easy, but it's the best and it's the only way. It's the only way. That's a good note. Amen. God bless. God bless you.